So good afternoon, everyone. And it's a great pleasure to be here with all of you today. Thanks to Mindre. The topic I'm going to discuss today is uh, Six Sigma, which is to be used as a tool for laboratory excellence. Now, in the past, when we thought about our commitment or pledge to quality or to do well unto the patient, I will refer to the Hippocrates Oath, which most of us have taken as doctor. So as doctors, we have pledged to do the best according to our ability and judgment to keep patients away from harm and injustice. And for years together, actually, healthcare has depended upon the innate excellence of clinicians, physicians, doctors, their individual expertise, which cannot be really defined or measured, and the, their actions in good faith. So all this is what has driven quality in healthcare and excellence in healthcare for years together. Now coming to today, and laboratories in particular, I'll be speaking about the laboratories, obviously. So today's laboratory looks something like this, with a lot of people involved. There are phlebotomists, there are technical staff, there are your lab managers who are looking continuously at your quality controls, your operations, your costs, your LIMS. So the working of the laboratory today is an integrated, you know, it's a, it's a lot of many integrated processes involving personnel and information technology. Right from registration to reception, preparation of the samples, work allocations, trainings, technician uh, allocations to departments, their shifts, then validations, method validations, IQ, QPQs, approvals, report approvals, then the report, report going, reaching the patient, the TAT, accreditation requirements, statutory requirements, logistics and transport, biomedical waste management, and LIMS. So there, are, there is so much to do in today's lab. So we cannot really depend you know, on only my ability, only a physician's ability, only a pathologist's ability as such. We will have to look at certain methods, strategies, and tools for quality management. So when we talk about laboratory excellence, what are we talking about? We want the laboratory to operate with accuracy, with speed, and with efficiency in order to deliver safe, reproducible, and patient-centric healthcare service. So broadly, there could be two components here, isn't it? So there's an analytical component, analytical excellence, which ensures accurate and reliable results. And you have operational excellence. So there was just a question a few minutes ago that how do we look at processes, especially the pre-examination and the post-examination processes, where we cannot apply the so-called traditional statistical QC measures. So operational excellence is where we have to optimize the processes to achieve maximum efficiency and productivity. Now, what are the challenges that healthcare in general and labs in particular face or have faced for some time? Well-established protocols and benchmarking in healthcare came much, much later as compared to the rest of the industries, and it is still a work in progress. So healthcare has had to draw from other industries, look at other industries. What are the other industries doing for managing processes well. At the same time, the complexity of disease and medicine and human body makes industrial grade quality a distant dream for us. We cannot be compared to a precision tool manufacturing company or a fan making company at all. Despite that, I would say in fact amongst the healthcare sector, labs have been more proactive from very early on in using QC, because we've always been running controls, right? As far as I remember 30 years ago, also applying statistical QC 
I have started off with actually plotting the LJ charts on a graph paper. So we've been applying statistical QC for a long time, histograms, scattergrams of different types. Then there, are, there is lean management, there is the caissons, there are cost-benefit analysis. The ISO standards help us to benchmark and follow quality. Training and retraining and training of staff, quality circles. So there are so many types of tools that we can use for quality management. Today's topic is Six Sigma. So we will discuss Six Sigma in detail. This is a concept which was introduced by the industry, General Electric and Motorola companies. It has been adopted by both the manufacturing and service industries, as well as now, of course, the healthcare institutions from hospitals to reference laboratories. It is a management strategy that seeks to improve the quality of process outputs by identifying and removing the causes of defects, errors, and minimizing variability in processes. So Sigma metrics allows comparison of different processes with each other across different institutions and different industries. So this is the interesting point of it, that the other ones are more subjective, the political uh, tools which I pointed out earlier, or then statistical QC. You know, you cannot be on a coffee table discussion and say that the uh, CV percent of my cholesterol assay is so and so to other people. But when you talk in the terms of sigma, it becomes a universal language because it is recognized across the globe and across the industries. So what does Six Sigma uh, do actually? So Six Sigma measures two things. One is it measures errors or defects as it is called. Defects per million opportunities. And on a scale of zero to six, Six is world-class sigma, 3.4 defects per million, and three is the minimum sigma that is required for any business or manufacturing process. It also measures or can give you an idea about the variation in a process because every process, you will never expect that every time that that process happens or is carried out, it will be exactly the same. So there will be variation, which is inherent in these processes, and that creates an opportunity for errors to happen. They could be due to the common causes, the variations, or special causes. Now the goal of the Six Sigma strategy is to eliminate or reduce all variations in a process so that the outcome is as best as can be every time. Now, how can we apply it to the lab? So when you're measuring outcomes or defects, you inspect outcomes and count the defects, calculate the defects per million, and convert the DPM to a sigma metric using the standard sigma table. Now, this can be applied to operational processes. So this can be applied to all your pre-examination and post-examination processes. On the other hand, if you measure variation, like, like how we have always done traditionally, so the bias, the imprecision CV percent, and the total error, then you can calculate sigma from a simple formula, which I will show, and this can be applied to analytical processes. So this seems to be the beauty of the Six Sigma tool or the Six Sigma strategy, where you will be able to apply the same quality management strategy to both your operational processes as well as the analytical processes. So suppose we take, now, Sir, Dr. Thupil Venkatesh just spoke about the pre-examination errors and right on the top was misidentification of patient or patient registrations in the demographic error in the patient registration. So here is an example. Units or registrations are 2,74,257 and there were 93 defects in this process. Now I have said opportunities three. So what are opportunities? Opportunities is what can go wrong in a demographic, while doing a demographic registration. 
So either the patient name can go wrong, the date of birth can go wrong, the gender can go wrong, the mobile number can go wrong, the Aadhaar card number can go wrong, so on and so forth. So there will be so many opportunities for error to occur in a demographic, in a registration process. So with the standard sigma calculations, you will have, sorry. Yeah. So with the standard, so all these formulas, there's no need to be bogged down by these. These are very easily available. The calculators are very easily available on the internet. And you can just go to any one of these or add, add in a QI macros onto your Microsoft Excel. So all these calculations become very easy. So you have a defects per million opportunities, percent defects, percent yield, and a sigma value. Let us not go into what is short-term sigma and long-term sigma at the moment, because that will be confusing. Let us stick to the sigma value 5.19. So for this process, if there are 93 errors or defects of any of these kinds, then the process sigma for is 5.19, which is a acceptable process sigma. So I've just explained the calculation. If a laboratory reports 1,000 ED stat results in a month, which is the product, 10% or 100 results are not reported out within the specified period of time, so TAT is missed, defects. The number of opportunities for defect is three because the delay can occur either in the pre-analytical, analytical, and post-analytical phases. So defects per opportunity, defects per million opportunities, use the sigma table and you have a 3.3 sigma for this particular process. <clears throat> the number of opportunities is sometimes difficult to understand. This is the simplest example that if you have ordered 100 shirts and three of them are defective, then one could be wrong size, another one could be of the wrong style and the third one could be of the wrong color. So every process that you have, you will have to define the process, what you're going to measure, what will be counted as the defect, and how many types of defects can occur. So let's say this registration errors are finished, so let's go here. So citrate sample rejection, one of the important pre-examination processes or problems uh, where we do not want underfilled or overfilled tubes. So here, for example, the sigma in our laboratory was more than six up to March. There seemed to be some issue in three months, and then it is back here. So this is the area at this time you need to intervene. You need to do certain corrective actions, and then it was back on track. We will discuss this later. So how to, so if, if I had a more than six sigma, and I had a four sigma, then what, I, what do I really need to look at? So if the sigma is less than three, I already said, most manufacturing service sectors everywhere, they consider a process which is operating at less than three sigma as unacceptable. You have to improve it, right? Here, in fact, it's a no-brainer because you will immediately find the most obvious problems in that process which can be corrected and the sigma improved. If the, pro if the process is at four sigma, then the processes have to be improved, that is each step has to be looked at very carefully. If you are at four sigma and you want to achieve five sigma, then you may have to look at the design of the process itself. If then you want to achieve six sigma, you will require very rigorous tools a complete revamp of the design and then work towards perfection. So while zero harm or zero error is a bold and worthy aspiration, the scientifically correct goal is a continual reduction. So you go from three sigma to four to five to six using the DMAIC process or strategy. So that is defining the problem measuring the baseline performance, analyzing the data, then going to the root cause. For example, I showed you that in three months we had slipped on the uh, citrate tube uh, sigma, uh, sigma count. 
So there we will have to see where the training has gone wrong, whether suddenly a new B2B or hospital has been added, where we have not given clear instructions. And then if we correct that, we can get the sigma correction. So improve and then control and ensure sustainability. So practicing the philosophy of continuous improvement, getting a little bit better every single day, you can always try to achieve Six Sigma. Now in analytical or examination phase, how can it help us? So evaluating manufacturers' performance claims, support in decision making when purchasing new analytical systems, ongoing assessment of method quality throughout the lifetime of an analytical system, and QC planning, selection of appropriate QC rules or procedures based on the sigma metric of the method. So the sigma metric calculation is a very simple formula. Sigma is equal to percent total error allowable minus percent bias upon percent CV. An allowable total error is an expression of how much combined imprecision and inaccuracy can be tolerated in the test result without negatively impacting patient care. So again, very simple calculations. If your error total allowable error is 10, at L1 control your total precision or CV percent is 1, and the bias that you have taken either from your peer group or from your EQAS is 3, then sigma is 10 minus 3 upon 1 is 7 upon 1 is equal to 7. So this is essentially a very simple calculation. Of course, like I said, it does depend upon where have you taken your bias from, whether you've taken it from a reference material or reference method, peer group mean, or proficiency testing, or any other source. Similarly, it will depend upon where have you taken your imprecision from, whether you've taken it from your historical imprecision, that is your three to six months QC data, or within run, between run imprecisions. It will also very heavily depend upon the total error allowable that you have chosen. So if you have chosen a minimum requirement for performance, then you will have a good sigma, 10 in cholesterol, creatinine, seven, okay? For certain period, this is, see, these are examples, so these are for a certain period in the laboratory over a certain uh, number of controls, etc. And if you have chosen a desirable level of total error allowable, then the sigma is this and this for the same, uh, for the same period and for the same level of control. So what does it mean? So it means that the laboratory will be able to define the quality that it wants to achieve, okay, can decide what is that, the quality requirements for your lab, your routine diagnostic lab, your specialty lab, your clinical research lab, whatever that it might be, and then accordingly calculate the sigma. Now what do you do if you have assays less than three sigma? So you will have to do a, a series of corrective actions, you will have to check a lot of things, your QC reagent, calibrator stabilities, check for any outliers in the cumulative data, verify the manufacturer's claims, check the TEA, if you, the use TEA is appropriate, and the assay method or assay design, because some assays inherently will have a lower performance sigma. Now, if all your methods or analytes are showing less than three sigma, this might, it might mean that the quality requirement that you are wanting to reach may not be practical. It might be too tight, so you can even loosen it depending upon the clinical outcomes. Uh, if you have an analyte less than four, you can also, now that the new standard and the requirement for risk management is, again, something which we are now learning to incorporate into day-to-day -day working of our laboratories. Here is an example that if you have an analyte with sigma less than four, you can use one of the uh, commonly used Ishikawa's or fishbone analysis for investigation. So you can look at same, the same things which I said just now. 
So the differences in methods across industry, your calibration frequencies, what multi-rules are you applying, what error have you chosen, are your materials near expiry, is the storage not proper, whether there's good compliance to procedure, the theoretical and technical knowledge of your personnel. So all these causes which can lead to a lower sigma performance have to be looked at. Now, when, you, when your sigma is 3, 4, and you want to improve, you should also have a pointer towards what should you improve. Whether you want to improve the, whether you need to improve the accuracy or the imprecision. So for that, you can use a quality goal index, which is again a very simple formula, bias upon CV after reducing, and it will tell you the extent to which both bias and precision meet their respective quality goals. So if your QGI is less than 0.8, you have to work on the imprecision. If it's more than 1.2, you have to work on the accuracy. Now what happens if there is a happy situation and the better end of the spectrum and your sigma is more than six, right? So here, the sigma metrics can give you a lot of cushion from day-to-day -day variations, lot-to-lot -lot variations, personal variations, etc. And you can choose a tighter quality requirement. You can design an individual quality control plan. You can choose the multi-rules to be applied and save on time and materials. Remember one thing, there's no such thing as 10, though I had myself put in a value of 10 because that is the value which was there. But it is basically more than six sigma. There's no, nothing great about having a 14 sigma or a uh, 15 sigma, it's not like that. It's more than six, less than three. That is how you have to look at it. So if you have a very robust method which is performing at a good sigma, then you can use lesser number of QCs and you can use lesser number of multi rules and that will save your morning time and resource in the long run so for example if we had three or four multi rules applied and about four to five outliers because this particular assay was performing at more than six sigma we reduced it to one rule and got only two outliers so Westgard or other, other sources give you a good table of what is, if your uh, sigma metric is six or five, what rules should you apply and what should be the frequency. I had mentioned that we can use it for analyzer evaluation also. So either when you're going to go in for a new analyzer or the one which you already have, if you know how many of the assays on that analyzer are in a good sigma level and how many need more attention, okay? So that will also help you. One is, everybody is aware then that, okay, these assays have, might have slight problems and we need to look at them more carefully. And if you're buying a new analyzer, obviously you will try to go in for an analyzer which is going to give you most of the assays in a, uh, with high performance. Because it was lab excellence and I have been talking about processes and people have been asking about processes, you can then apply to, so our purchase inventory person is applying it for, uh, this is his terminology, good, uh, goods uh, return, the, the defective kits or uh, materials that he finds. So in these many orders, he had three defective uh, materials which he had to return, either because of the wrong lot, wrong quantity, or the wrong price, and the sigma level he derived is 5.3. So you can basically apply to whichever process you want. So this is call resolution. At our call, uh, call center, we had, suppose we had a lakh and 92,000 calls, 177 error, that was customer grievance. Customer was not happy with the call address. 
So either the calls were missed or there was inadequate information given. These are the opportunities which we have identified. And that particular the sigma here was 4.8. So what I'm, the point I'm trying to make is that there can be a huge number of candidate processes where you can apply the Six Sigma. Inappropriate test requests, delay in pickup or transport, incorrect fill levels, sample lost, I, I like the word misplaced, data transcription errors, notification of critical values, errors in billing, cytology specimen adequacies, so many. However, over the last 20 years, our journeys, it has started becoming that, you know, we are more of uh, statisticians or mathematicians rather than doctors. In fact, I took up medicine because I hated mathematics. So uh, I do not like this, that all the while we are getting embroiled in these numbers. So what I would suggest is that you use, use these quantitative targets with caution and as applicable. They are our tools and not our masters. However, the eye does not see what the mind does not know. So many insights can be drawn from these exercises. So it's not as if even my ours is a standalone lab uh, catering to about 1,500 to 2,000 patients on a daily basis. Like Dr. Venkatesh already said, everybody is overworked. Not that the purchase inventory person is going to actually sit and do the sigma metric every month and on and on and keep doing it and then keep doing it for each small process, no. But like I said, it does give you an insight. Firstly, they design the process. They start thinking about it. They get an insight from it, which really helps. So goal in the form of such targets have an important role but should never displace the primary goal of patient care. So it is not just a sample or value, it is a patient. And I will still believe in my ability and judgment and expertise and experience to do no harm to the patient. Thank you for a patient hearing. Excuse me. Thank you, Dr. Manisha Patwardhan. Because as you have already told, that this is a very difficult uh, issue for pathologists not being the mathematicians. Definitely you have uh, explained the topic in a nice and meticulous manner. But still there may be some issues. So the topic is open for the, any discussion or questions or doubts please. Hello. Hi, that was a very lucid presentation. Um, regarding the opportunities that you were uh, talking in, uh, in each type of defects, when we talk about the number of uh, delayed reports or the number of repeat samples or anything in the pre-analytical phase, uh, for all this, then uh, the opportunities will be only three, right? No, uh, that was an example. So what basically you will have to do when you decide to uh, measure the sigma metric or apply the sigma metric to a process, you will have to jot down the process. And you will have to put in the steps. So it could be anything. So it, you know, because according to your process, you can define as many opportunities as you want. Okay, so that yeah, is yeah. So it is subjective. It is, it is not subjective as I would call it. If you actually break down the process in the proper modules, you will automatically reach those opportunities. You know, so that, that will be individual for each of the different processes. Process. Okay, thank you. 